welcome to the Tech Recruit Podcast. Today on our show, we have the very popular Tim Sackett with us, who was actually voted uh, HR's most influential professional. So welcome, Tim Sackett. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. Do you work on your own recs, or do you manage some of the job searches? But it makes sense that you have a staff that does that. But I was curious just how in the trenches you actually are. So you're more doing a lot of consulting right now. Definitely do a lot of consulting on the TA side. Help, I mean, recruiting, recruiter, um, like, like TA process efficiency and, um, and just all of that. A lot of tech stack stuff. So I do though, I mean, I, I have meetings with my recruiting teams every single week. Um, so I'm still in the weeds in terms of, you know, I, we just had a couple of projects that are helped, um, you know, work on in terms of just uncovering people. I'll come up, come in on a Saturday. If I know recruiters are going to be in here working on like a last minute project, I'll come in and help them source. Cause I, I still consider myself a practitioner and my ability to kind of do that. Plus with my network, it actually makes it really easy for me to reach out for people. Sometimes, especially if I have a new recruiter working on something that they have a really small network, like I can, you know, with a couple of hours work, I can pretty much fill their position or at least help them fill their position. Um, and so some of that's just helping them, showing them. I, I mean, I demo over 100 TA techs a year. So, I mean, I, I always tell people, like, I don't know if we're the best recruiters I think we are. I know my tech stack. I would put against anybody in the country, um, yeah. maybe anybody in the world. Like, I know, because I, just because I'm, I'm so ingrained into the TA tech world, I know that I can get uh, access to tech stuff that's not even out publicly yet, right? So I get to test and try a lot of stuff. And some of that stuff is awesome. Some of that stuff doesn't work for us, but I get to you know be on the forefront of all of that. So I actually have two questions for you along those lines. One I was yeah. going to ask you, because this question comes up a lot, and it's probably one of the most difficult things, is how do you hire great recruiters? Or how do you hire recruiters who are going to produce? What does that DNA look like? Gosh, I wish I had the magical formula. And it's something that with um, I'm part of I'm, a, I'm in, incoming president for ATAP the, the Association of Talent Acquisition Professionals and something that we're trying to put together and we bring people from staffing RPO corporate um, even the vendor community together in like committees and they'll work through that process to say what does it take to hire a, a better recruiter or and like in my case I'm in Lansing Michigan um, I hire a ton of entry level people that have no recruiting experience. They might have experience doing something else, um, but it could be across the board. I mean, one of my top recruiters was a guy we brought in who was managing a car wash, like literally managing a car wash. Um, but he had this personality, like when you would see him and just how he gravitated towards people and he's exceptional. I, I just, I always feel like the right personality you can teach anybody to recruit. We're not trying to launch the space shuttle. Um, and, I, and for the longest time, I always told people like I would only hire four year degree people. And, and, and again, some of that wasn't necessarily Explain educational. Explain that, 40 degree? What is that? No, no, a four year degree. Oh, sorry, yes. Like a bachelor's, yeah, like a bachelor's in something. I could care, it could be whatever, basket weaving. I didn't, it didn't matter. For me, it wasn't the educational biases as much as I think that good recruiters are people who stay with something and get it over the finish line. And if you've gone through a four-year degree process at a university, they don't make it easy for you to graduate. Like you have to go through the classes and you have to should pay the money. But then even at the end, you have to like fill out the application and pay the fee and do the thing and blah, blah, blah. You, can't, you have to keep dotting I's and crossing T's. And that's recruiting, right? Like we get yeah. the opening and then you send some resumes to the hiring manager and you think they're good. And then he says, no, they're crap. And then you go back at it. And eventually bad recruiters give up and yeah. another recruiter will fill that, right? Mm -hmm. And the best recruiters are the ones who just stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. And so for me, that was why I chose education. But then I realized that you can actually have that same kind of personality in a lot of ways. Like I found stay at home moms, um, we hired a couple of stay at home moms that were out of the workforce for like five to seven years that were exceptional, right? Like they, they came to work and thought it was a holiday. They were like, this is like the best job ever. Like, I don't have to deal with, 
you know, 14 school things and kids and running around, like all the crap that they had to do and all the different like priorities. And so we, um, we found out I have a tanker, um, a, a mil, like an army. He was in a tank, drove a tank, right? Retired out of the military. Um, and again, just an exceptional guy that we were able. So I, I, I wish I had the magic, like, you know, formula yeah. for what it took. Right. And it just, I don't know if it's out there. When you, your team in particular, I'm, I'm curious what you work on, um, technology, um, specifically on technology positions, do you yeah. split your team from sales to recruitment or is everybody full desk? No. Yeah, we split. So we have, um, recruiters, we have account managers and we have sales. So we have, we kind of break it up in those three areas for the staffing side. Okay. Um, and so then I guess that leads me to my next question, your tech stack. I, I yeah. find this to be so interesting because I think it, it obviously it varies by every company and every agency. Tell me about your tech stack. Well, I don't share my internal tech stack um, with staffing people, right? Because I think that's an actual competitive advantage that we have over everybody else. Um, I will espouse to a lot of technologies that we use, whether it's, you know, CRM, sourcing tech, um, you know, SMS, like there's all kinds of pieces to the, to the tech stack that we use that we think is really good. Um, you know, but when I meet with corporate TA, a lot of times their tech stack is a little bit differently. And I think we really take a look at it from the core of what's your APS? What does that do? Um, what are your results? What are you measuring? I, I mean, really the effectiveness side from recruiting to me doesn't necessarily, you could have no tech and be great at recruiting. Yeah. I think the technology allows us to be great faster. Yeah. So if you're, and so we, and we put a ton of money into training and that's the one resource, you know, that I'll share is that we've been now uh, two and a half years in on using social talent mm -hmm. um, for our, training our recruiters. And it's a nonstop. So, I mean, every single month, every single week, even my most experienced recruiters are still getting developed on new stuff on what's the latest and greatest. And I think that's super important because I was in staffing environments and corporate TA environments for a long time. And what we tended to do was train a recruiter till they got up to speed and then we just forgot about them. Sure. You know, all right. Yeah, yeah, they're good. Tim's good. He's got it. Just give it to Tim. He can, he'll fill it. Don't worry about it. He's, he's good. And then the only way that you got training was that if you were new or you sucked. Yeah. And if you were good, you had to kind of do it on your own. And what I found was we saw like noticeably uh, like increases in revenue and placements when we actually started developing our entire team um, because we measure everything. I'm a crazy person when it comes to analytics and metrics when it comes to recruiting. And so we were able to show like, I mean, a, a substantial ROI by actually doing that kind of ongoing training month after month. That's uh, the continuous training. That's, that's interest. That's so exceptional that you're, you would, you would train your recruiters continuously. Cause I actually started in a fortune 500 recruitment agency and, mm -hmm. uh, that, that was really it. You, it was, it was hands down probably the best training I ever had to start in recruiting. Um, but it was videos and it was extensive reading and, and doing, you know, um, you know, what shadowing and, you know, those, uh, you know, different power plays and, and, uh, you know, and then that was it. And then it was just, you're kind of on your own. Um, so, so that's, that's interesting. And, and Johnny Campbell is great, isn't he? Love, I love Johnny. Yeah. That, <sighs> that entire team. the best resources. Well, and again, he, Johnny came out, I mean, he started his career in, in the staffing world, right? That's what he was. He ran, you know, a staffing company and was a grunt like a lot of us. Um, and so then when he came up and said, how would I train other people to get them up to speed faster to keep them better? Like he, he knew, he knew what it was going to take. And like, when we're talking about the world that we recruit in now, when everything is changing and API stuff is changing every day, mm -hmm. a great example is like LinkedIn, right? Like LinkedIn in the last month or so basically eliminated the ability for you to download email lists, right? You should be able to say, oh, I'm going to export all my contacts and I have this great email list. And they just kind of like, they just decided, nope, we're not going to do that anymore, right? We're going to make it harder on recruiters to take that network with them somewhere. Now, you can still get the email of an individual, but now you'd have to go through, like, I would have to go through 10,000 people on my LinkedIn connections and individually put their you know, email into a, a spreadsheet. But, again, through social talent, like they, 
they find ways around that. They find other technologies that will allow you to do that and different things. And so my team stays relevant, right? They say, because we, we make sure we download our contacts continuously, probably on a monthly by monthly basis, because you never know when that's going to change, right? And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't have this network anymore. And we just, we have to have it, you know? Continuously, I would um, download and export my contacts in LinkedIn because as recruiters, that's where we live on LinkedIn. And you do a recruiting um, conference. You know, you do the, the Michigan Recruiters Conference and I do yeah. LAX Tech Recruit in Los Angeles. So, you know, we're all about helping train recruiters. So we live on, on LinkedIn. So, yeah. And when they took away that, the emails on your, when you export, I was just like, what? I did it three times thinking I was doing something wrong. <laughs> I know. Like why the column's still there, but it's empty. I don't understand this. Um, yeah. yeah. Again, like Social I'll talk talent. to corporate, okay. I'll talk to corporate people that have like, they're like, Oh, I've never exported my contacts. And you're thinking, well, what happens when you get hacked or you lose that or whatever, like your entire value as a recruiter is built, not just in LinkedIn, but it's built on your total network. Right. And there's a lot of times that's where we've decided to keep that, that network kind of, you know, displayed, you know, for, for, you know, for the most part, whether, or, or your ATS. I mean, it's a, it's a combination of both, you know. Okay. So no, no, um, not too much about your own tech stack, but you are on several <laughs> boards, one of them being Luxo. And I actually spoke with Matt Chambers um, a couple weeks ago out in Denver. Yeah. Yep. Very nice gentleman. Um, so we were kind of exploring, um, his applicant tracking system and that integration. Are you okay with talking about that? For if sure. No, I love this. <laughs> no, no, I love okay. Luxo. I mean, it's an ATS. Um, and we went through, I went through a year, probably a year and a half of just scouring the planet for a, an ATS that we really wanted. And it's a big decision because it's a commitment. Well, and for the most part, right, like there's there's one or two ATSs in the staffing world that basically own 90% of the market and they're basically garbage and, and, and they're expensive garbage. And yet we go, oh gosh, you have to have this one, right? Um, it, you know, if you don't use Bullhorn, like, oh my gosh, like you don't even know what's going on. And I'm like, they're terrible. Like, why? I don't want it. Like I, the, the, ba the bad ATS I had was, was better than that. And I didn't have to pay half of what I was paying for it. So there's probably 1,200 ATSs on the market. I really yeah. wanted to go out and find something. And what happened was, um, you know, Stacy Zapar um, had put me on Alexa though because she started using it and was like, hey, do you know these guys? Like, I started using this tool, and it's completely incredible. I demoed it the first time, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is exactly what I've been searching for for so long. Um, not perfect, but they're new, um, and, and they're continuing to kind of build, build and change. But for the most part, like what we're able to do is so much better uh, than most of the ATSs in the marketplace. And it's again built in the last probably 18 months. So mm -hmm. I felt like the different the differentiator with them was the the um, campaigning, the um, social like the CRM social media component of it. And it that is I felt something that was hard to well it seemed like like a dream to marry it with an applicant tracking system but then you almost have that nervousness like if i marry it and then i have to you know uh get rid of one of them or we have some sort of change in our system and they're married together is that going to create a problem should i have them separately you know and and i'm sure yeah. as as a, to go back to your consulting um you probably come into situations with HR teams and companies where they have those sort of pains where we have this tech stack, we've grown or we've gotten rid of this department or whatever the catalyst might be for your engagement. Um, and, and maybe those are some of the things that you help them go through. Are you open to maybe yeah. giving some case studies on, on things you've done? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, one of the things I knew that we wanted to do with our tech stack was this ability to nurture candidates, right? I mean, we already know on a CRM standpoint that if you nurture clients or, you know, we see it and it's been used in retail forever. So like I'm a shoe guy, like I probably have, have 200 pairs of shoes at home and I constantly will be looking online like at Nordstrom's and see this pair of shoes and then you go off and all of a sudden that shoe just keeps coming back at you across you know, programmatically, it's, it's hitting you in, in multiple ways mm -hmm. to the point where it just wears you down. And I'm thinking, <laughs> why, why aren't we doing that with candidates? I mean, because here's 
what happens, right? And we, right, so um, we, have, a, we have a digital kind of phone system and, and we track everything. And so what we knew was our, our bad recruiters, recruiters that failed in our environment, would try to reach out to a candidate once or twice, right? They have a list of 25 candidates. They reach out to them. Those candidates don't respond and they just give up and they'll go with whatever candidate did respond. Even though if you rank those 25, one to 25, in terms of who, who they would rather would want, rarely would those top 10 candidates actually respond. But as we went through and started nurturing, w through email, through SMS, through phone, like a, multi like a multitude of that, over like a 72 hour period, after we got to about nine contacts, we would get about 90% reply. Mm -hmm. And that was became the big difference was our ability to automate that nurturing process, right? To be able to, to go forward and say, not just through email, not just through in-mail, because those had a really low response rate. SMS has a super high re response rate, but the combination of all of it together was what really um, set it, set, I think set the, the, the numbers apart in terms of being able to get people to respond. Because that was really the difference, right? The difference between us as a recruiter or your competition across the street was are we, are we, willing, are we getting, doing the work to get somebody to respond to us so that we can get them in front of you know, whoever? And, it doesn't, and I can sit there and say that's a staffing issue. It's a corporate talent acquisition issue as well. It doesn't matter whether I'm selling somebody into a corporation or I'm a corporate talent acquisition person who's trying to get a hiring manager to hire, you know, a position so I can get it off my, you know, my, my list and then work on something else. It, it doesn't change. Being a recruiter in corporate or being a recruiter in staffing really shouldn't be any different. I, I have always felt as I've been a recruiter in the last 10 years, every time I've reached out to a company and I've, I've worked with Red Bull, I've worked with Live Nation, Ticketmaster, that you are green dot. We, you are the face of that company in, in, in kind of a different way, but in a big way, because the first person um, a candidate speaks to is the recruiter. And it's, it's marketing because it's your first touch point. It's how you engage that person. And that experience is, is that first impression. Um, so yeah. to, to combine it with that ability to nurture on social media and have that remarketing component of it when they visit your site and then they start getting these like, either it's ads or blogs or what have you to kind of nurture and remind them of who you are just seems like it goes hand in hand. But at the same time, I feel like it's somewhat new that recruiters are now taking advantage of it. And as I've been doing my conferences and inviting speakers to come, um, especially in the Los Angeles area, I've asked them, so in your recruiting division, do you have a, a designated marketer who helps with the marketing and nurturing the candidates and, and there, and it's always this, that's an, an initiative that we have. We haven't quite gotten there yet, but it's something that we're doing po probably yeah. next year and they're still trying to figure it out. Yeah, no. And again, that's one of the issues I think with any tech stack and, and I do a lot of testing of the stack and doing things is every stack is going to be different, right? There's not one perfect stack for any company. It all depends. But if you don't have anybody willing there to keep work, like keep looking at stuff, keep testing stuff, you're never going to get to that point where you actually have something that works really well um, from that standpoint. And, and I see that a lot in organizations where they're just overwhelmed. They don't use the technology they have. And so they go, well, we're not going to bring in more technology, which is the exact wrong thing, right? The right thing would be to say, hey, you have an ATS. If you're not using it like you should. Let's go back through and look at that. Let's go back through and use that. As, you know, let's become a super user of that piece of technology you have.